Akawa and his uh, colleagues for their efforts in getting me here to this uh, splendid meeting. So uh, yesterday, so, so yesterday we had uh, several examples of how uh, nanotechnology has benefited from uh, uh, fundamental discoveries uh, in bioscience. And um, those developments are predicated on a, a deep understanding of the biological phenomena. And the field that I work in, although it's been studied now for uh, more than 10, if not uh, 15 years, um, it has been well studied. Nonetheless, there are still fundamental issues that uh, remain to be uh, resolved. There are applications that have developed, of course, but um, I, will, I will concentrate on, on the fundamental aspects, and I'll emphasize the, the things that we still need to know. So over the past uh, 10 or 15 years, um, a whole series of molecular machines have, have emerged uh, in biology, and they're characterized by uh, a number of common features. Um, so first of all, uh, they need an energy source, which, can, which is more often than not is either adenosine triphosphate or, or sometimes GTP. And in, in two important cases I'm going to talk about, it's a proton motive force which can effectively be considered uh, to be a voltage. And another characteristic of uh, molecular machines is that they have moving parts. And when we, when we look at the details of their molecular structures, we can see uh, features that we can interpret in terms of, of uh, man-made features in, in man-made machines. So for example, um, and I'll maybe point out, uh, there, there, there are bearings, there are hinges, uh, one can find clamps and valves, diaphragms, cogs, and even an uh, escapement mechanism, uh, such as you have in a clock, is found in one particular uh, machine that I won't describe. And also the molecular machines are often characterized by having energy storage devices uh, that, that uh, are a fundamental part of, the, of their mechanism. And so one can see the springs, for example, uh, and elastic elements. And the analysis of uh, molecular machine, machines in terms of features of man-made machines has turned out to be uh, surprisingly uh, useful and has helped to bring about a deeper understanding of how the molecular machines work. <coughs> There's one feature of biological machines which differs enormously from, from man-made machines and that is that by and large uh, molecular machines have only got uh, one material, proteins, and so the proteins have to provide a whole range of uh, biophysical characteristics to make these machines uh, work. Whereas, of course, in the, in the case of man-made machines, uh, one has the benefits of material science to provide whatever properties uh, are required uh, for optimal functioning of a machine. And in, in biology, we find a whole range of different uh, kinds of machines. So, for example, uh, kinesin, which some of you will be familiar with as a molecular motor, is, is processive, and it, it moves along uh, uh, filaments carrying uh, cargo from one end to the other. Uh, myosin in skeletal muscle can be best uh, described by analogy with a rowing machine uh, such as um, uh, one finds um, in the race between the Oxford and Cambridge universities. Um, there are also two-stroke two engines and the best example of a two-stroke engine is the grow el grow es complex that's involved in the, in the folding of proteins. And then there, there are rotary motors, which is the subject proper of my talk today. And I'll, I'll talk primarily about the ATP synthase. I'll mention also uh, the, 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 the bacterium flagella motor. And I'll also mention uh, DNA pumps and, and DNA and RNA helicases, which are also rotary uh, motors. Um, so, th 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 another analogy that's been widely used in biology is that the mitochondrion is the powerhouse of the cell, and it's here as we know that energy derived from feed stu uh, foodstuffs that we ingest are converted uh, to ATP. This is a depiction uh, of uh, a mitochondrion with its two membranes shown in false color. The blue, uh, the blue area is the outer membrane, and the inner part is the highly in, uh, invaginated, the yellow part of the highly invaginated inner 
membrane where the energy transducing processes take place. Uh, in terms of the, the coupling of the proton motive force in the ATP synthase, um, has, has it, is, there a, is there an estimate or has anyone made a measurement of the voltage dependence of the rotation rate or the proton concentration dependence of the rotation rate? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, below a certain minimal voltage, the machine uh, won't work. Um, I think that's about all that can be said, apart but from knowing what the stoichiometry of protons per is. But is the rate is. continuously variable? I guess is really yes, what I'm it, getting it, at. Yes, it, it, it will slow down at lower voltage, and eventually it stops. And does it does it saturate at a at a higher rate of uh, or a higher voltage? Yes, yes. Uh, I mean the. The, there is a maximal rotation rate that, that uh, can be observed. It, it's the number that I've been quoting. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. But unfortunately, I couldn't follow you completely. <laughs> so could you, tell, could you tell me again what determines the direction of rotations in uh, ATP uh, synthetase? It, it's, it's the handedness of the structure. So um, <coughs> synthesis actually is not the, is not the reverse of hydrolysis um, uh -huh. because of the, of the, symm the symmetry or the asymmetry of, of the structure. Mm. So it's structural features uh, within the enzyme uh, that uh, endowed with a asymmetry that give it the directionality that, that, uh, that, that, that is observed. And the same is true, of course, of the membrane part as well, which is also asymmetrical. <coughs> 